Hello, my name is Lucy Newcomb. I'm the CEO and host of this episode of Staying Global While Staying Home, Solutions for Pandemic Business Leaders Around the Globe. Today, I'm so pleased to be able to spend time with and share lessons from C.H. Lowe, who's the director of the MIDA office here in Silicon Valley. MIDA stands for Malaysian Investment Development Authority. Before we go on to talk a little bit more about that, let me just tell you a little bit about CH as we affectionately refer to him. Uh, he has been head of this office since 2017 after graduating with a degree in electrical engineering, perfect for the Valley here, and uh, then going on to obtain a advanced credential in financial management at Cornell. He specializes in bringing Malaysian companies to the United States and vice versa. Uh, he's got some really interesting tales to tell with us and tell us and lessons to learn about lessons for us to learn about uh, going global, especially in ASEAN and the special attributes that Malaysia has to offer American businesses. Welcome, CH. You want to tell us a little about MIDA? Thank you, Lucy. Always a pleasure and, and thanks for inviting so yeah, sure. Um, um, our office has been here since 1999, and then we mainly serves the U.S. companies here who have interest to set up operations in Malaysia or any kind of you know um, business opportunities to help companies expand by using Malaysia as their hub in Southeast Asia. So I mainly work with the corporates uh, for America. I mean, from the America side, and as you as you imagine, that includes like uh, mostly uh, big corporations. And I think because Malaysia has a pretty strong foundation in serving US companies, like we have been the first offshore location for Intel since 1970s, and that has grown leaps and bounds after that. So just continue to be here, build relationships and continue to help, uh, happy to help you know, US companies and, and Malaysian companies to do more businesses together. Thank you. Well, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes in our conversation, but uh, it's, I didn't realize that Intel had been there since the 1970s. That's really impressive. Uh, as you know, I had the pleasure of spending time in Malaysia as a speaker for the U.S. State Department and had the pleasure of going to five different locations. So I got to see a fair amount, and it only makes me want to go back, both as a business person and um, as a tourist. It's a beautiful country, and I was so impressed with the business acumen and the, the dedication of talented professionals. And it's been a pleasure to continue to work on that bridge, and, and I look forward to doing more of that with you and your team. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, if you look at the history of Intel in Malaysia, they always like would show a picture of like Andy Grove, like walking walk, walking through like a like a agriculture. Like, I think it was a rice farming in Penang. So I think it was the first factory that broke broke ground broken ground in in I mean in, in Southeast Asia at that time. So and then that operation has grown, you know, a lot since then. It started with assembly and then gradually, I think in the 1990s, like they started to do more like shared services function. And then it gradually grows into more design and development activities right now. So I think today Intel has more than 4,000 engineers just worked on developing products, you know, um, supporting the US operations here. They have the whole IoT group based in Malaysia. And even some of the most advanced technologies like autonomous driving, um, I think some of the, um, the data center applications and all that, I think Malaysia plays a very key part into that. So, so we, we are working a lot uh, together with Intel to basically promote that, um, to, to sell you know, the Malaysian story because not many people know about that. And no, thank you for, yeah, thank you for approaching me and you know, you know, to suggest this session because I think um, definitely we need to do a lot more promotional um, you know, sound, sound bites about Malaysia and, and to introduce Malaysia to people in the Valley. I think that sounds great. I'm looking forward to assisting with that. And um, yeah, I was really sold. You know, I did a lot of work in Africa, so I was very surprised to be called to ASEAN. And it was a life-changing moment for me. And I, I won't gush further, but I'm very glad you're here. And thanks for sharing some of those tales. Let's go a little bit deeper about American companies while we're on the subject and talk about, you know, the subject of our podcast, of our webcast here. You know, how are American companies navigating the pandemic in Malaysia? And maybe you want to set the stage for us about what's happening with the pandemic in Malaysia as context for those comments. Yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, um, everywhere is the same. Like, it's a, it's a very challenging operating environment. Like, regardless of like which corner you are at in the, in the world right now. So, M Malaysia, like, we 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 did pretty well in managing a pandemic in the beginning, right? I think um, there was a time that I think the national confirmed number of positive cases was uh, two digits. 
for several weeks. And then because, because of, you know, um, because of uh, se several events and, and, you know, things like, um, because the culture there as well, because people tend to like to go to office and work. And, and it's, it's just, just the difference between companies in the Valley and companies in Malaysia, right? Because work from home is still not a norm there. So when people go to work, when people start to kind of like move around and then that's where, you know, like the, the COVID cases comes back. But, but, but then on, on, our, on our level, we're trying our best to facilitate US companies to go into Malaysia because border control is, is strict right now, like most of the countries. And it, it requires a lot of education and, and creating that awareness with the immigration authorities about, and health officials as well on how to make sure that businesses can maintain open and then to make sure you know business activities can can continue, people can still uh, meet. So so yeah, that that's we we spend a lot of energy in that for the past you know several months or a year that uh, to kind of facilitate that, right? Then I think um, for for companies like seeking for market entry or even setting up operations in Malaysia, they 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 require they are required to send like quite a lot of executives into the country. Just to make sure they do the proper site selections and stuff like that. Right. So, right. so, so, so naturally, you know, border restrictions become uh, uh, an issue, and we're trying our best to, to, you know, try to try to bridge the gap between authorities and and try to provide a solution to the company on, on that aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we take a quick minute to talk about Lamb Research and sure. your recent uh, go to market uh, assistance with them. Mm -hmm. Even in a pandemic, I think that's very impressive and certainly relevant to the to what we're doing here on the webcast. You want to talk in brief about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll I'll tell you whatever there's public, right? Uh, that that's published. So right. so j just a little background about about the operation because uh, about the project. So it was the first meeting that I had uh, when I came to San Jose, like uh, oh. in 2017, and it's it's like a like a full circle. Like it it might be it might be. The last project that I handle, I don't know. So, so, so that lamb research like is setting up like a 700,000 square feet factories in Malaysia, and they would do very high end, sophisticated manufacturing and semiconductor equipment, uh, semicon cap as they call it in the industry. And it's 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 an area where Malaysia does not have in the past that we do not have any semicon front end cap equipment maker in Malaysia. So it kind of created like a, like a shockwave throughout the industry. Like, hey, why why is them looking at Malaysia but not the other competitors or companies, right? So then it brings a whole bunch of supply chain companies and at the same time going to Malaysia. So, and and we, 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 we're, I mean, I consider ourselves like, like blessed to have secured that project right in the beginning of the pandemic because things would have taken a, a much dramatic shift if that said the decision was dragged on for six months or seven months after that. And I think part of why the decision uh, was made by LAM was because businesses have to move on and we all foresee like there is a strong demand going on in semicon cap market, which is evident um, through the chip shortage that you're seeing right now. So there is a need to urgently build up capacity, especially in, in Asia Pacific, where all the semiconductor fab is located at. Um, so yeah, I think I think that it's a project that, that we are very proud of and we're doing all, all we can to support that. And yeah, so so it, it comes back to, to the original kind of like a, your your the, the issue that we talk about was the border restriction, right? So yeah, that, that's where I spend our energy on in supporting them. And um, were there any particular thanks for that? And were there any particular um, I don't want to say hacks because that that minimizes the seriousness of this situation, which is of course very serious. Um, but are there any particular let's say workarounds? Uh, any any solutions that you and Lamb working together found that were necessary and helpful? Because go-to-market is always tough and then semiconductors in that technical level tougher and then the pandemic, holy cow. So uh, did you did you find some you know particularly helpful solutions you might want to pass along? Sure. I think I, I think for Lamb's case, right? So um, because if if we th there are several pathways that you could enter into a market and set up operations. I think for for their case, they chose to be, you know, send a bunch of uh, expats into Malaysia because it's a new process. It's a new technology that we have never dealt with. We might not have the technical expertise in dealing with those technologies, right? So just send them there, let them settle down for two to three years and setting up the operation rather than having people to go in and out because we, God knows when, when the border situation will clear out. 
right? So, so that's that's uh, really really how how we approach you know this project, and and then yeah, I think I think it's very important to partner with governments, right? Because right now I think it's it's very important to know who to talk to and how to talk to them, and and how should you plan for the, any business contingency plan? Because border could be closed at any time. Not not only Malaysia, but even transiting countries. Or even new rules surrounding, you know, um, traveling restrictions and flights keep changing. You know, like uh, it could be. I, I, I've, I've heard executives who bought, who book a flight two weeks. I mean, in two weeks' time, but then the flight got changed, like maybe one day before the flight time or something like that, and required testings and and all that kind of stuff. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just so that we're clear for our audience, so Lam was setting stuff up when it was not only the pandemic, but at least part of the time, Americans were not technically allowed in the country, correct? Um, Americans are allowed in the country, right? So now they are, the, the I mean, to arrive, not to live, but to arrive. They, they are allowed to, 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 go, to go into the country, yes. Okay, because I know there was a time where we weren't. I remember my, my friend Michael posting this huge thing, all these people who cannot come here now, and it, right on the top was United States. I thought, well, you know, that's when we were in the peak of our pandemic, and I have to say, I understood the call. But um, I think that just that whole logistical hassle is such another. Sure. It's another sure. reason this is an impressive project, right? CH yeah, 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 yeah. You're right about there was a period of time when, but that was much earlier. I think it was yes. between yes, it March was and true. June when it's, it's not country specific, but generally the border was closed. And then after that, I think one thing we learned out from the pandemic is um, the government learns a lot about supply chain, right? Because yes. I think a lot of countries, they just, uh, I mean, learn about that when there are companies who kind of call us and say, hey, do you know like the chip that we're producing actually goes into the ventilators or the chip you're producing actually goes into certain medical instruments wow. used in the COVID combating you know, um, uh, applications or solutions. And then because Malaysia is such a hub for a semiconductor uh, backend assembly and we have some fabs in Malaysia as well. So it's, its application is very pervasive. So one thing that we kind of learned out from that is um, semiconductor manufacturing is essential and the manufacturing industry in Malaysia is essential, right? So, so it's important to make sure that it, it keeps running and because it's so integral to the global supply chain for medical devices, for electronics, for everything, right? It, and, and right now it's for automotive industry as well. So we keep, keep the conversation open and keep engaging with companies and even try to talk to the health ministry, try to make sure you know, uh, the the that the company follows the standard protocols that they set up upon to make sure that they're allowed to operate. And I, I think so far, although uh, although it was a it was a rough patch, right? It's not easy. No one has done that before. Then, no. um, mm -hmm. but the the recent lockdown that we announced in in January, it was a much um, better situation compared to in March when when everything no one's kind of know um, how to do things, right? So yeah. <laughs> And now you have a lockdown till March 4th, I understand. Yes, yes, now we have until March 4th, yeah. But but I mean, I, I don't want to just, just talk about the border restriction thing, so if- No, if, no, yeah. but it's important. It's important for us to understand that you were successful. And in order to understand the magnitude of your success, we need to understand the magnitude of the problem. It was substantial. <laughs> and so we're yeah. not being negative, we're just clarifying how awesome you are <laughs> and how impressive that Lamb was willing to persevere. I think those are the things that I would want people to take away. Sure, so, sure. so thanks, so, I understand. Yes, so, so we are not like trading Lamb differently than any other company. So we are supporting right. all the existing companies in Malaysia as well. And then I think this support to, to combine that with a combination of you know, cost competitiveness, infrastructure readiness, and relatively stable operating environment in Malaysia, it makes Malaysia kind of like an, a very attractive uh, proposition for, for companies to set up a kind of like a niche uh, manufacturing operations or high, high end, high pro IP proprietary products. So I think if you kind of like, uh, kind of like dissect the kind of investments that goes into Southeast Asia or Asia Pacific in general, like there are those who's always seeks for um, cost, right? It's always just to go to low cost. I don't think we are competing in that segment and we shouldn't be competing in that because there's always a cheaper location, right? And, and but the problem is how do you maintain that cost competitive, com competitiveness by a package, right? Like what do you get by every dollar you spend? So normally when companies does assessment on, on site selection throughout the region, uh, we always get 
feedback from them that Malaysia is always on top or second, right? And 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 right. there's and there's another end of the spectrum. It's like if you're looking for really high end tech technical talent, really high end operation, and and you want to set up, set up a regional hub. So th that's an area that we are trying to drive towards, and we are doing all we can to you know set up policies and setting up uh, facilitation services and keep engaging with companies and see how we could do better in that space. There are certain successes in that areas um, around surrounding some of the projects that we are working on that is not announced yet. So, so yeah, yeah. So we are kind of like smack, smack in the middle of that, right? It's, it's, it's where you kind of find a sweet, sweet spot between you get a diverse talent pool and then you get a, a good cost um, structure and then you get a relatively stable operating environment. And yeah, yeah so, so that, that's kind of like where, where, where our position is. And, and that's why companies like LAM or Dexcom that was announced um, and Intel and all that just keeps expanding in Malaysia. And I, I think definitely, I think um, we, you, you got to know more about Malaysia when you're there, <laughs> right? So normally what, once companies are there, they're happy about it and, and they just want to do more things in Malaysia. Yeah. That's wonderful. And it, it can be also a launching pad for other areas in the region too, right? Yes, 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 definitely, definitely for sure. Because, because of the kind of like diverse uh, population that we have, I think we share almost the same uh, kind of, I, I would say um, ethnicity and, and, and people like, like Singapore. And, right. and then we're kind of like the pro close proximity to, to Singapore as, as a regional hub in Southeast Asia. So, so there is a general, like a natural extension whenever companies tend to expand, if they want more space, if they want more people, then I mean, naturally people will look at Malaysia. Right? If we're talking about um, the high-end projects, yeah. <laughs> Terrific. And then when you talked a little bit earlier about um, not just the impressive sort of bedrock of semiconductor companies that you have, but then starting to look at other high-end places um, without talking about any specific deals here, what type of technologies would you be thinking of? More like data analytics or things like that? What, when you say high end, what are you referring to specifically? Sure. So, so because MIDA is more um, related to manufacturing services, so that's why I'm more expert in, in, in that area. Like I know more about that. But definitely, how do we grow out from that area is what that we are working on. So, we are partnering with existing companies. Like um, I think we are working with Intel to develop more AI capabilities among yes, yes, they are. institutions in Malaysia. So that's in supportive. I mean, that, that's uh, we also throw in some support for that effort. So, and then try, trying to bring in more kind of like regional um, functions into Malaysia at the same time as several companies that we're talking to. So setting up not only like um, assembly, how do we grow from assembly into engineering and then into regional hub or in, even like research and development capabilities, right? Just to leveraging onto our experience in, in, in the high-end um, product space. Right, so many people might not know like a lot of the processors um, being used in data centers are basically produced in Malaysia or a lot of chips that goes into our smartphones are actually made in Malaysia. So when, it, when you dissect the smartphone supply chain, like usually those that the, the, the headline grabbing news are the assembly part, right? But, but those are including, I mean, the, mostly are manual labor, just assemble stuff. Right. There isn't a lot of like value add activities, but, but but the kind of like, if you, if you dissect the bomb cost for a smartphone or any smart devices these days, semiconductor actually is, is a substantial portion of that, right? And, and including the electric vehicles, like I think as, as a lot of talks about batteries, but I, I believe that that would become a commodity in future. Yes. And, and what sets um, companies apart could be how intelligent their car is, the autonomous system, the software, and also the hardware behind that to support that. And that comes from, uh, from the chips and from semiconductor companies that, that we have a pretty strong reputation in the area and we have a strong like, you know, case start to other companies, to, uh, to other countries, yeah. That's really exciting. I'm, it's wonderful to have bedrock industry, but you know, the all eggs in one basket, we've all learned, you know, diversification is a better plan. So I'm excited to hear how you're diversifying it. I would not have thought of an EV being made in Malaysia, but why not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we, we don't have the population like Indonesia or right. Thailand, right? But, but definitely we are involved in the supply chain for the chip side, for the board side, and for some of the development activities that we have through the existing companies in Malaysia, right? 
Yeah, and then, oh, and then I think I think interestingly recently, um, Porsche, the German sports car company, yes, of course, you know, there, there was a news uh, that they are setting up a factory in Malaysia in in in, in um, collaboration with a Malaysian company. So perfect. So yeah, that, that's just one of the example. Like we are kind of like in a niche kind of like high end manufacturing activity and trying to grow out of that. And and we have made some progress and just just keep working on that. <laughs> So we'll just have nice plates of Nasi Lamak and then get in our Porsche. That sounds perfect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, you know, in a way, because um, it, it's a nice place for people to go there, right? It's, it's Malaysia. Yes, is always, it is. It's always on top of the, the expats who, who would be sent overseas because it's cheap to live there. Quality of life is relatively good in, in the area. And then people are nice and, and it's relatively easy to set up team in Malaysia. It's easy to get loyalty among people. I think that's important whenever you set up an operation anywhere in the world. So that's the, the feedback that I got like, like, like from most of the companies. It's, um, I mean, loyalty is, 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 is a big part for you know, operations in, in Malaysia. Yeah, one of our advantages, yeah. And, and it's a wonderful characteristic. I was very fortunate to make good friends while I was doing my training around the country. And I have lifelong friends from that, and I don't take that for granted. But I really think it—it it seems to be an important quality of, that many Malaysians. I won't say all Malaysians, many Malaysians have, and I certainly cherish those friends. So it's—it's yeah. it's a wonderful. You know, we don't think of friends and employees together, but if you're going to have a disposition towards a characteristic, it's nice if employees are loyal, right? I mean, that would definitely be great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also building relationship because that kind of transcends any business or transactional relationship, right? So, Absolutely. So, so that's why like we have an office here and we're always open to, to talk to companies and, and listen what we can help, right? Even though we have certain inst institutional boundaries that we cannot cross, but at least, you know, we know how to connect to people and how do we make things work, right? And yeah, just, just try, try to facilitate as much as we can. Well, that's terrific. And you are a terrific office and very open um, and your events are terrific. I know the last last year we had one of the ministers come over and you put on a really high powered yet. For, I love the way the Malaysians and again, I may be overgeneralizing, but it, in my experience there, you know, we would have these high level conversations and then we'd have these breaks where the food was like a meal. I mean, <laughs> we were just mm -hmm. outrageous amounts of food. And, you know, this is where I think the pandemic must be really hard because work is such a social place and Malaysians as a whole, which, you know, again, grossly general, um, are such social people and it and so friendly. And I really appreciated that, especially being, you know, from overseas and usually very jet lagged most of the time. And boy, it was like not enough food, not enough friendliness. Everyone was so cordial. And so it just, it just seems like that pandemic would be extra hard. Let's let's talk a little bit about. I know there are not too many Malaysian country, uh, companies in America, but have, have you got a sense? And this is kind of off the cuff. Have you got a sense of how Malaysian companies are faring with the pandemic in America? In America, yes, you're right. We we don't have many Malaysian companies operating here. We have like some factories. Um, I think in Arizona. I think just one of them, and then. Um, mostly our sales and engineering support office here, mainly to support the, the multinationals operating here, you know, the likes of Intel, Google, and all that, because they're their customers, right? right. So, so I think I think they have been faring well. Um, I, in the beginning of the pandemic, they have been, most of them, they send their employees back to Malaysia, but there are also uh -huh. several companies who chose to have their employees to stay put in the U.S. just to see things through, right? But unfortunately, the like, pandemic kind of dragged on until today, but, but I, I, I want to quote an example, like there is a company called Great Tech, a Malaysian company who does automation services for many notable US companies. They have easily 40, 50, or even 60 Malaysian engineers right now in, in, in the US like serving those companies, right? So, so it's a matter of like, how do you compensate your employees to, to be willing to take the risk for the company and be here? And of course, at the, at the same time, have to ensure that um, they're, they're safe. Right. So, so I think, yeah, that's that's uh, that's just how the situation is. And then and then in Malaysia, because we are we are I mean, a, a lot of our economic activities is surrounding manufacturing. So it involves co close proximity between people. Right. Among operators and, and engineers and all that kind of stuff. So it's not easy to to get through this pandemic uh, without getting people to go to work. If not, then a lot of companies will just close shop. 
right? So, so that, that there is an ongoing effort on how do we automate companies in Malaysia, both um, foreign owned companies or even the domestic companies, right? So um, we would provide some funding for them to basically engage one of the consultants, engage and you know, access how ready they are for automation. And then we would support and link them to the proper automation companies and kind of like provide a solution for them to make sure that they are ready for future. So yeah, that, that's just some of the efforts that's ongoing and taking by, by my headquarters in KL, yeah. Well, thank you. We'll have another chat sometime about uh, Malaysian business in America, but it's, I think it's good to get both sides of the coin. Um, and of course, we really appreciate everybody who's staying and making things work because automation, it's almost like if you continue to uh, explore AI and things of that nature for extending Malaysian business presence for, of American companies, it's almost like those engineers are working on the future for you because automating all those things are what you folks want to do later, right? So um, I think it'll yeah. be worthwhile, but tough, tough, but worthwhile. Yeah, and, so, and, and, and remote, sorry, remote working is also like a, like everyone's talking about that, right? And and Malaysia is naturally a human capital factory. <laughs> I think absolutely. we have a lot of uh, locally born Malaysians who actually served in the in the board or even in the C C positions for several Fortune 500 companies, even in a in the valley. So I think one thing that I see is that with this pandemic, that companies don't mind where you're located at. So I, I see companies here hiring people in Malaysia that, um, but we don't have an operation of that factory in the country. Right? <laughs> so, so in a way things are getting more integrated, but in, in, a, in a globalized way, right? So we, without you know, a boundary <laughs> anymore. Yeah. Do you think that will continue after the I pandemic? Kind of, I kind of think, yeah, yeah, that will continue after the pandemic because um, many people find that it's working well for them. <laughs> yeah. Of course. It, yeah, even for us, Maida, we, we we have like like never been really doing a lot of remote working before this, and and as you would imagine, like government, a lot of documents are still in a physical copy. So this pandemic has kind of pushed us to automate stuff, put things into cloud, and even um, roll out a series of initiatives to basically digitalize our our processes like manufacturing license, it used to take like at least eight weeks to process and get an approval. But now we, create, we have created a platform that you just submit your details in and submit the application and you can that, get that within two to three working days. So I think That's those, terrific. Those are, yeah, those are some of the positives that come out from the pandemic. <laughs> well, I'm very glad to hear that. Um, you echo what other of our, many of our other guests have said around the world that digital transformation has really been accelerated from the pandemic and sounds like it will stay, sounds very positive. You also talked about supply chain understanding and really a deeper understanding of how things are connected is how, what I heard you say earlier. And so those are two uh, unexpected silver linings, we would call them here in America, things that are good that came out of this situation. Is there anything else that is an unexpected benefit from the pandemic and the conditions it's created? I think, I think yeah, like, like uh, people, like generally companies tend to think, you know, maybe they should diversify because in the past, maybe several of them have been intensifying their effort into several specific country. And through this pandemic, like we are getting conversation around, should we do more in Malaysia, right? So generally the conversation shifted from rather than setting up their own operation, could they outsource some of the work into Malaysia? So, so that, that could really accelerate the whole process effort and kind of, um, faster. So yeah, we were, we were doing a lot in supporting those initiatives and trying to connect them to potential Malaysian companies or even do a joint venture on several initiatives or business activities in, in, in that effort to try to do things while the border is not, um, it's, it's, it's tricky to, to work around that. <laughs> well, luckily diplomacy and joint collaborations towards profitability and serving customers transcend borders, don't you think? As our conversation yes. today has said. Yes, yes. Well, one thing I really appreciate the, the US investors um, community is their openness to basically work with companies and, and people in Asia, especially Malaysia. So we, we really appreciate that support and, and yeah, try, trying our best to help. You know, I think Malaysia is in an interesting position because there are such behemoths and giants like China in the region. And, you know, Malaysia doesn't always get its chance. But I will say, once people start to learn about Malaysia, 
it's an easy sell. You know, it's an easy understanding as to why you're successful as, as you know, from the people to the opportunities to the projects to the stability to the weather to the beauty. It's it's really such a wonderful package. It's just a question of awareness most of the time, I think. Yeah, yeah. And and on investment promotion of front, like so we are trying to be neutral geopolitically. So we welcome investors regardless of they're from China or they're from US, right? So we just want to offer a platform for people to grow, right? And we can provide people, we can provide infrastructure, and we can provide you know high technical skill sets. And yeah, so that so that's that's where we stand right now. Yeah, and, and how we how we look at ourselves. <laughs> Yes, and one of the things that's exciting to me and that I hope we'll work on one day is the growing venture ecosystem for startups in Malaysia. In fact, it's probably the only country I've come across. I'm certain it's not the only one, but the only one that I've come across um, that angel investors had tax deductions the way we do here for charitable institutions. So, you know, there's definitely a growing startup infrastructure, although you're focused on corporates, we do have audience members from startups. So I want to signal that I actually trained over 300 entrepreneurs there of all shapes and sizes, and that the economy, um, and I had the pleasure of being a mentor for Startup Malaysia for a year. So, you know, there's definitely all kinds of things happening there. And I'm, I'm so excited to speak with you today, CH. Thank you for your time and all the best to Malaysia, well beyond the pandemic. It almost doesn't seem necessary, but I wanna give you our, our very best regards to Newcom Global and here's to your continued success. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, happy to participate your your future event. You know, if uh, if it's about startup, like I can definitely pull in some people to do another one with you if let's say you're interested to do that. Oh, so thank you, thank thank you for your support and yeah, <laughs> have a good day. You're welcome. Thank you all for joining us again. It's Lucy Newcomb, CEO and host, and Newcomb Global. We are here to help assist you global business from the inside out, go to market, market strategy, global leadership development. And we will be speaking next month with Sorenju Jorgensen about life in Europe at the moment and how things are coping and changing and how companies there are managing. So please join us next month for that. Thank you again. If you'll stay on one more second, you'll see our contact information on the next slide. And thank you so much for joining us. Please stay safe.